morning, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, and we are going to be concluding our series um, today. And uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about our source in a, a little bit different way. Our source of victory this morning is what we're talking about. And if, if you've been with us over the past few weeks, um, we've been talking about the idea of trusting God as our source. He is our source. Amen? He's our source. And so um, the first week we saw how God began this whole thing off through one man, Abraham. And uh, through one man, he made a promise. And the promise was a nation. It was a people group. Uh, uh, and he set, him apart, he set them apart to himself. And then from one nation and one people group, uh, we have been affected, each of us, as uh, what the scripture would call Gentiles, uh, people who are not necessarily Jewish, we have been affected through Jesus Christ. And for those who are saved in the room, he has become our source of salvation. How many of you, how many of you would say, he's my source of salvation? Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so then last week, um, I showed you how God wanted to be Lord in more than just the areas that are easy to give up in life. Uh, so we talked about how God is our source, and he, makes a, he made a promise that if we bring back a portion to him of what uh, he has already given us, um, if we bring that back, um, that, that he will open the windows of heaven, and he will pour out a blessing until there is no need for more. And I believe God is able to do just that. I mean, he is a God who is, he, he stands behind his word. And so um, I, I pray that if he's not already, that he becomes your source in that way. This morning is our last installment of this particular series, and, and I want to talk to you about how God is the source of our victory, how God is the source of our victory, and as you're turning to uh, 1 John 5, throughout Scripture, um, we see a lot of terms used in Scripture to describe people who are, uh, who are walking with God. In fact, uh, if you were to look, and we know that believers, they were first called Christians in the book of Acts in the, the town of Antioch. If you went back to Acts, uh, you would see that Christians were first called Christians in, in Antioch. And then throughout the rest of Scripture, we begin to see different terms in, uh, that are used to represent who we are to be as Christians. Um, for instance, first, uh, John chapter 1, verse 12. You don't have to turn there this morning. You can stay in 1 John. Uh, but John 1, 12 says we are called the children of God. How many of you are a child of God in here? Amen? You know, we're children of God. Ephesians 5, 8, we're called children of light. Um, we're children of the light. And because he is light, in him there is no darkness at all. Amen? And then um, in chapter uh, 5 of 1 Thessalonians, we're called sons of the day. Daughters of the day. And in other places like 1 Peter 1.14, we see the phrase obedient children. We are children who are to be obedient. But this morning, I want to, to show you another term that the New Testament gives believers. And that is actually the term overcomer. Everybody, just look at your neighbor and just say overcomer. Just say, God wants you to be an overcomer. Just look at them. That's the title used in our text this morning that I want you to see, 1 John chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse 4 with me because that's kind of where we're going to start, and then we're going to kind of back up, but it says this in verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. In other words, there's some folks out there that, that maybe they, they might think they're saved who haven't really been born of God, but were maybe born of self, maybe selfish ambition. Uh, maybe they were born of something else other than God. And, and then it says this, and this is the victory. Everybody say the victory. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, and it says our faith. So this morning, I, I would like to show you just three aspects of a, 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 a a, a true believer's life or, or someone who's really been born of God as it pertains to being an overcomer as a Christian. And, and, and the first thing I want you to see, I want to kind of look at this, is just the idea of what it means to actually be an overcomer. 
literally what it means. What does Scripture describe an overcomer like? And the first thing I want to look at is that the, as, the, as we look at the definition of what it means to be an overcomer, when you look at verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God uh, 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 overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So right off the bat, you begin to look at it in verse 4. Only those who have been born of God can actually be an overcomer. In other words, if God's not your source, like we've been talking about through this series, I mean, you, you are nef- definitely not going to be able to overcome. And, and you may say, well, overcoming what? Well, ultimately, as you'll see in a little bit, we are looking to overcome sin. We're looking to overcome our flesh. We're looking to overcome the world. We're looking to overcome Satan himself. And if you are a Christian, it's not that you won't struggle. In fact, let me just tell you, how many of you realize that I, I, I've, I've been around a few Christians where they say, man, Pastor Tony, it's just such a, such a hard thing sometimes to be a Christian. And I'm like, yeah. And they are like, you know what? I just feel like I struggle so much. And I'm like, yes. And they're like, what? You know, it's like we want Christianity to be easy, don't we? We, we would really like it to be a, a bowl of cherries, right? We would like it to be like a nice dessert, you, you know, um, chocolate pudding, you know, or something, something real easy, something real nice. Um, how many of you like banana pudding? Anybody in here? I'm going to make you hungry before you go, but, um, you know, I, we look at it and, and we want things to be easy, but the deal is if, is if you have truly been born of God, you are going to begin a lifestyle that is continually in competition with the three things that we face, the world, our flesh, and the devil himself. And so now I think this is interesting. If you look at the, the, the original language, if you take your Bible and you know, uh, obviously most of you in this room know that our Bible was not written in English. It was not written in the King's English either. Some people want to say, well, I go back to the original version in 1611. That wasn't the, the original version. Um, that's kind of a silly statement. Um, but uh, because the, the reason is, is because the Bible is written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And so when we go back and we look at the original language, the Greek word for overcomer literally means victor. The verb form is, and you may recognize this verb, uh, it's nikau. I mean, and literally, it literally means to conquer, to have victory, to have superiority. Other times it means to defeat. In other words, you're defeating whatever it is you're overcoming. But the Grecian people in John's day, as we look at, the, uh, at 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, the Grecian people in John's day, they, they believed that victory could only be achieved by a certain uh, uh, select and mainly what we were talking, what we were talking about is we were talking about the gods, the Grecian gods. I mean, and so only the gods were going to be conquerors. Only those G, gods, small G, and so they, they were they were unconquerable, and there's no way they could be defeated. In fact, the Greek goddess of victory. I mean, how many of you have ever seen this? The Greek goddess of victory was named Nike. <laughs> that, that's where we get. The, the Nike symbol, it's where we get the Nike uh, mentality. And so it's interesting that when John actually uses the word in the Gospels, everybody just hold your place in First John and turn with me real quickly to John chapter 16. It says the other, this is the same John, but I want you to turn to the other, his other book. You look at this in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says this. He says, I've said these things to you that in me... In, in me, he's talking, he's, he's talking about the idea of, of in Christ, y- y- that you may have peace. In the world, you will have what? You'll have what? One more time. You'll have tribulation. You'll have trouble. You'll have difficulty. But he says, take heart. I have what? I have Nikau. I have Nike'd <laughs> the world. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you need to Nike the world. Pop, you know? You know, and this is actually one of the, the most awesome statements that John witnessed from Jesus. And so because it's actually, it's, it's actually a word of victory. Some of you in this morning, you're in here and you're like, man, it just feels like sometimes I just feel like I, I wake up and I feel like I'm defeated. How many of you have ever woken up and you're like, man, I do not, it's Monday, I do not feel like going to work. I do not feel like getting out of bed. I do not want to go make the donuts. It's not my turn. I just don't want to do that. I'd rather turn in my, you know, I, I quit. It's kind of like we, we were looking at that this morning. Uh, you know, Elijah goes and sits under a broom tree and just tells God, I quit. You know, how many of you ever felt that way before? 
You know, and so... Uh, if you actually look at this, this word of victory, um, as, as I look around and see on the news how things are getting darker and darker, and I'm not talking about just the eclipse tomorrow, but you know, globally, mankind seems to need God less and less, and they seem to be sticking their middle finger up at God and saying, I dare you. In fact, I want to believe in science instead of God. I want to believe in all these other things except God himself, the one who is the creator of the heavens and earth. And so how there are signs in the heavens like we'll see tomorrow, Jesus, in effect, is saying, hey, listen, I want you to know something. I have overcome all All of that system that you are having to fight against. I have overcome it. I have overcome the world, he says, which reflects one of the truths about a Christian according to God's word is the fact that a Christian is actually in Jesus Christ. In fact, if you turn to, I'm not going to have you do this right now, but if you turn to John chapter 15, which is another very, very significant part of the gospel of John, John chapter 15 is the idea that we have God who is the the vine. And, and we are the branches, and, 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 and the only way that we can stay alive is to stay in the vine, to stay alive as a branch in the actual tree trunk, if you will. And so God is the tree trunk. God is the source. God is our hope. God is our future, amen? God is the one who is able to bring us out of the miry clay. And so if you're a true Christian, there is an indivisible union here. I mean, when you and I are united with Christ, we end up being a partaker in his divine nature. And a a Christian partakes of everything that Christ is. A Christian partakes of everything that Christ has because he overcame the world. You and I, too, can overcome the world. But we suddenly, you know, we begin to look at it, and, and that includes his inheritance. I mean, he becomes our righteousness, our righteousness. Our righteous, your righteous, my righteous, it's his filthy rags, the Bible says. It's unclean, it's dirty. And so, but we suddenly don't want to sin anymore somehow when we're born of God. We, we, have, some, we have some people that are new in Jesus here. I was talking to someone new in Jesus here in the last couple weeks, and um, I'm telling you right now, they said, it's just something happened to me. Something has changed. Something, there, there's, it's like somebody flipped a switch inside. And he says, I, I, I get teary-eyed when I think about going and doing something wrong. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I, I, I get teary-eyed when I go and I think of going and doing something that's not right. And, and so, and, and, he, and I could just, as this person is talking, I'm like, God's presence is all over this person. And the reason is, is man, God has given them life. God's given them hope. And God's given them a future. And so they, they are overcoming in Jesus. And, and it's amazing because what happens is when we, when we begin to, to be in his righteousness, what happens? He comes along and he puts, Romans says, he puts a cloak on us, a cloak on us. He puts a, a cloak of righteousness because our righteousness doesn't fix things. Our righteousness doesn't do it. Our righteousness doesn't work. And so God puts a coat of righteousness on us and we aren't interested in sowing to our flesh anymore and we're not interested in trying to be better than everybody else. And the miracle of being in Christ has occurred. Something has changed. And so because Christ is a victor and he is an overcomer, Nikau, I mean, we are overcomers. We are Nikau. We are Nike. And so let me just tell you, through this life, it might appear Satan is winning. And believers, ultimately, I want you to see this, overcome three things, ultimately. And the first one is the idea that we overcome Satan himself. How many of you ever felt like you were just battling against the enemy? Just felt like you were just, just I mean, it felt like he was just tormenting you. Anybody ever felt that way? I think if we're all uh, uh, wrestling to to walk with Jesus, this is going to happen. There's going to be times when you're going to experience attacks from the enemy himself. But one of the things Christians have overcome is Satan himself. I mean, we are victors. We are victors over him. Uh, It may seem Satan is victorious even nowadays. But how many of you know that ultimately Satan will not win? I've read the end of the book. I've looked at the book of Revelation. And I've seen that the, that the, the victors with Christ Jesus, those who have, been, who have been given life from Jesus Christ, those people ultimately are going to win with Jesus Christ. Revelation 6, 2, he comes out, Satan himself comes out conquering and, 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 and conquering everything that he can conquer. And for a while, even in the last days, you look at the book of Revelation, it will ultimately look like he has the victory. It will look like for a time that he is winning, he will cause some devastating things to happen in the earth, uh, early part of the tribulation 
like we talked about several months back, but how many of you know that that is not the whole story? It's not everything there is. Ultimately, the book of Revelation says that the saints, they're going to triumph over Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved their lives not even unto death. I mean, I look at Revelation chapter 15, verse 2, and you, I know you're not going to be able to turn there this quick. You might write these down and look them up later, but Revelation 15, 2, uh, it says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the numbers of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Again, a picture of the victorious believers in heaven having conquered Satan and his false trinity, the uh, part of the, the false prophet and the Antichrist. Romans chapter 16, verse 20, you can look at it. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. In other words, Satan has been defeated. Guess who defeated him? It was Jesus Christ that defeated him. He defeated him at the cross. It's an exciting time for a believer. If you're here living in these days, man, we are living in some crazy times. And the thing is, is that, man, God is on the throne and he has made us to be victorious. God has not called you to walk into your place of work to be defeated. God has called you to walk into your place of work to live a victorious life. I don't care what you've been through. God is able to bring us through whatever you're going through. How many of you know what I'm talking about right now? So... There's a second thing that we overcome, and that's death. We come over, overcome death. And as soon as you're saved, the Christian overcomes death. You may say, well, how so? I mean, we haven't died yet. Again, supernaturally, there is a, a transaction that when partnered with God and his power, something happens to us in our nature. I want to read it to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57, it says this, when the perishable puts on the imperishable. I love this language. When the, when the perishable, in other words, when death puts on the non-death. I mean, when, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal parts uh, uh, puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Yeah. Oh, death, where is your victory? We hear this read at, at Christian, at people who have lived for Jesus. We, we, we read scriptures like this at Charlotte's funeral. We read scriptures like this in places where somebody has passed away, but the thing is, is we know that they haven't passed away because they are alive more now than they've ever been. I mean, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As true believers in the source, we conquer death. Why? He did. He conquered death. And so we are partakers in his life, also in his death. Cool promise, huh? Pretty amazing promise. There's a third thing that we overcome as believers, and that's the world. Again, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. You can see it right here. Whatever is born of God Whatever God does overcomes. Whatever God is doing, whatever. So if God does something in your life, you are going to overcome. If God brings salvation into your life, you're going to overcome. A believer is a victor uh, over the unseen, invisible, spiritual systems of evil that operate in the world. I mean, I could give you illustration after illustration of things that are happening right now. But how many of you know our hope and our, 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 our source has to be in God? And so as and God has overcome the world and so so he so does the believer. In fact, when you look at whatever is born of God in in verse 4 you you might think uh, you look at that and you you say, "Well, whatever is born of God." Well, I was born of God in 1976. I was born of God. That that's I, I, it it happened. Well, I want you to see this. If you look in the original language, what you're going to find is you're going to find that each of these these phrases are in present tense. In other words, there is a continual Every single day I'm getting up and I'm having to make a choice about whether to stay saved or not. I'm having to get up every single day. The Christian is going to continually have to have victory in the world, over the world. Do you know that last, how many of you had something last week that you kind of wanted to, maybe, you, you may have wanted to, you, I'm just going to say it, you may have wanted to punch somebody in the nose last week. Anybody? How many of you didn't? How many of you? How many of you? you some hands went down. Um, 
okay. Um, so, 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 you know, we have, to, we have to fight our flesh. We have to fight against these, these things that come along. And so I, every single day, there, it doesn't mean just because something, something happened last week and it was difficult and you wanted to punch somebody in the nose, doesn't mean that there's possibly not another one coming this week where you want to punch somebody else in the nose. So the deal is, is every single day, God has overcome the world. He's done it once and for all. But the thing is, is we are continually, uh, continuing to be overcomers. Every single day, I have to wake up and I have to decide, you know what? In Christ Jesus, I, Tony Lance, am an overcomer, and I'm going to continue to be an overcomer in Jesus Christ. Today, that's what I'm deciding to do. I mean, as difficult as it may be, as hard as life may be, I am deciding today I'm going to get up. Some of you students, some of you teachers, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go back to school even though the summer was wonderfully uh, mild and, and just beautiful this summer. But you got to get up every single day and decide to not feed your desires for the world system by dis- disciplines like the ones we've been talking about. Last week we talked about giving. We've talked about praying before. We've talked about fasting. We, we face the world. We face our flesh. We face, face the enemy himself. I'm convinced that many of the problems that, that, that may, many Christians face would be avoided with a life dedicated to regular giving, to regular praying, and to regular fasting. I mean, I'm not talking about ritualistically or, 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 or formulaically. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But as a means for me to continue to gain God in my life. I, I, I hear some people, you know, some great people, sometimes even in our church say this, and maybe, maybe you've said this, I've said it before too, you, know, you need to pray for me. You need, you need to pray. You, I'm just telling you right now, you need, to, you need to pray that God helps me to love the person at work that I'm ready to punch in the nose. You need to pray. And here's the deal. Here, here's, the, here's the problem with that. Let me ask you a question. Is God love? Is God love? I'm not asking you if he possesses love because the deal is, as we all know that, he does possess love, but he, it, not because he just, he had to go get it and find it somewhere. He didn't do that. No, 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 no. God is love. And so the deal is, is if you are in Christ, loving is just going to be something that you do because you're in Christ. Loving is going to be something that happens instead of having to have people pray for you that you don't punch somebody in the nose. The deal is, is what's going to happen. And I, I, I get this. I understand this because I feel it sometimes too. Sometimes we get in the flesh, do we not? So, you know, let me tell you, God is love. If you're in Christ, you'll do the same. You've got to die every single day by loving instead of not loving. And so if we struggle with sins of the flesh, I mean, you want to talk about the idea of sins of the flesh or maybe things that are, you know, we want, to, we want to overeat or we want to look at things we shouldn't look at. I mean, you start looking at it. God is spirit. He's not flesh. And so, so, so aren't you supposed to be in him? Aren't we supposed to be in him every single day? Then, then we will walk in the spirit if we stay in Christ, if we stay hooked to the vine. And so I hear people struggling with busyness and maybe too much going on in their lives. And, but, but if we're in Jesus, didn't Jesus say this? He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I, I, you know, uh, we're basically on our own and, and don't know God's power because we choose not to die to our flesh. And, and, and I'm telling you, it's a lifelong habit. God is calling you, he's calling me to a lifelong habit uh, that most Christians haven't learned how to do. So when you get up every day and you decide to die, die to yourself through the disciplines, when you give, there is something that happens when you give. It helps you to battle the need for more stuff in your life, to make things more about you. When I give something away, it's like, well, that was 100 bucks, and now I don't have it. Now I can't go to Walmart. So, you know, um, when you fast, you know, I really want chocolate cake. It helps you battle the enemy himself who wants you to be in your flesh and desire food more than you desire Jesus. And so when I do without 
food, not just cake, but food itself. What happens is, is sometimes I look and I go, you know what? How Do you know how desperately my soul needs Jesus? Because I just fasted and realized how hungry I was. But my, my, my spiritual, my, excuse me, my, my physical hunger causes me to realize how much my spiritual hunger is for God himself and God alone. There's something that happens when we, when we begin to do the disciplines. You know, so when we give, that happens. When you fast, uh, you know, uh, we're battling against the enemy himself. But when you pray, let me tell you, a lot of people don't like to pray. It's like, I don't have time for that. i got to be doing something. Well, what do you think you're doing when you pray? You're doing one of the most powerful things that a Christian could ever do. I mean, it helps you battle against the tendency we have to do things on our own. Like when I cry out to God, God, you're going to have to do this. Lord, you're going to have to make life church. I've told you the story before of me walking the premises after we changed the name of the church. We went from first assembly of God to life church. And I remember God told me to do, God told me as, as, as clear as day that I was supposed to do that. And I had people say things and they were, you know, saying things about me. I'm not assembly of church anymore. Uh, okay, Whatever. The bottom line is, is that God told me, life church, life church, life church. And I remember walking around the premises and I'm thinking, God, I'm looking at the blue sign and I'm thinking, God, it's not life church right now. And he says, you know what though? But I want you to look as sure as that sign is blue, as sure as that sign says life church, life church will live. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I had goosebumps, you know. But I said, God, as much as I have goosebumps right now, (laughs) It's death church right now. <laughs> it's death church. How many of you ever felt, how many of you ever been in a church where you felt like you were going for a funeral instead of going to? How, <laughs> okay. At least some of y'all being honest. Um, so, a, 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 an overcomer, there's life. Man, Jesus died so that you could have life. He came so that you could be alive, that you could live. And so there's a, there's a second aspect of, a, of, a, of an over, a true believer's life, and, and I want to describe to you an overcomer. 1 John 5, 1 through 5, if you're looking down through your, your Bible, um, or maybe whether it be on um, you version on your, on your phone, or whether it be in your actual Bible, there's three characteristics that are common to every single overcomer. You look throughout scripture, you see these actually in 1 John 5, 1 through 5, but, 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 but there are three characteristics that are common to every overcomer, even throughout scripture. And the first one is faith in Jesus. The idea that somebody puts their hope in him and he becomes their everything. And, and, and what happens is, is number two, there, there, there begins to develop a love for, for Jesus. We begin to see that he, he, he actually, his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he really wants to, to cause us not to walk around in fear. He wants, us to, he wants to cause us to walk around with not all these heavy sins on us and, 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 and put us through the stress that we shouldn't be in. And, and so we just begin to say, you know what, and that's just the parts of, of him that we get benefits from. But, but then you start to realize how much he loved you and how much he died for you. And, and, and so it causes us to love him back. And so, so there's a faith in Jesus, number one. There is a love for Jesus among people who are, who, are, who are overcomers. But then thirdly, this is the one that people don't like to talk about, and that's the idea of being obedient to Jesus. I mean, people who are overcomers are people who have a total trust in God. They, they love Jesus Christ with all of their being, and they want, they, they, they want to obey him in every single way they possibly can. And so, in fact, uh, the author of John, uh, John himself, John, the author of 1 John, ties all of these three, three things together. Um, look at it in, in, in 1 John chapter uh, 5, verse 2. Faith, love, and obedience. You can see them all woven together here in verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. Just turn, just turn, them, turn to your neighbor and just tell them, you are such a pretty children. God made a pretty children. We know that we Love the children of God, the person next to us that's pretty, okay? When we love God and we obey his commandments. God says, you love me, you're going to love everybody around you. And then he ties love to obedience. He he goes even further. He says in verse 3, he says, for this is the love of God. That we, what? 
I, I think it should be some I think it should be something else. I think it should be like, you know, if we just play pretty music for him and, and worship him and tell him he's great. Right? I mean, I, I think it should be, you know, I, I don't I don't I mean, Jesus, I, I I love your presence and it feels really great. I love to just lift my hands and worship, but Lord, when you tell me to do something, I don't know if I want to do that. You know, and so I mean it says this, it's I mean he's he's tying love. If you actually love God, what you'll do is you'll obey him. And so, so for, for this is the love, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments, verse 2. But then verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments, listen to this, are not burdensome. You may say, well, well it's kind of hard to live this life. No, it ain't if you're in Jesus, it's not. I, I say this, and I'm not saying that you don't have struggles, you don't have fights, and you don't have temptation, you don't have things like that. But how many of you know that when we begin to battle things in his strength and not our own strength, then we begin to find out how strong he is and how great he is. And instead of us getting any kind of credit that says, oh, yeah, Tony's great, and Tony does this, and Tony does that. No, 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 no. It's Jesus Christ that does it. It's him. It's to him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb. That's the one who deserves the glory and the honor and the praise, just like the angels we see doing in the book of Revelation. And so, so there is this thing that he, we begin to look at. It. First John is, John is tying these things. He's, he's tying faith, love, and obedience. He's tying love to obedience. Uh, he goes even further. If you, then if you back up verse 1, I want you to look at verse 1 in 1 John chapter 5. He ties faith, actual faith in God himself, to love as well. Verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father... Loves whoever has been born of him. Notice all three of these are inextricable. I mean, you can't extract one part out and choose the part you like and just go with that part. And No, no, no. He, he, he's, he's like saying, hey, th- th- all these three things go together. And so, and, and, and so, but the genuine proof of love will definitely be the la- last one that we're talking about is the idea of being obedient. God wants us to be obedient. What does he want us to be obedient? What is he telling me to do? Well, he's already written an entire book that you should be getting to know. That you should be, you know, marking it up. And I know some people don't like to mark in their Bibles, but that's silly. You just mark it up. Mark it, you know, write things down. Show what God is doing. Say what God's doing. So, because how many of you know the proof is in the pudding? Amen? And so it's not that we should obey out of fear, though. God wants obedience. Um... What if, what if God, what if God did this? Um, Jamie, um, my glasses, I need to stop doing that. My glasses slide down my nose, and then I have to do this. Anybody ever have to do that? Anybody do this over and over and over again? I'm going to have to get used to this again because these new ones are bad. But anyway, aren't you glad God doesn't come to you? And I'm not just saying you, Jamie, but... Just us in general, you know, I, and, I, and I'm teasing about a gun, but love me or else. You think about it. Could God do that? He could. He could do that. He could say, love me or else. The deal is, is that he loves us so much, though, that he gives you and I, he gives us a choice. And that choice is reflected in this subject that we're talking about with the idea of obedience. Obedience is one of those things that, that, that when I tell my children to do something, there comes a point where you're like, you know, you should do this or else. But, but we're training them so that when somebody, uh, like a boss later on, or someone like God himself tells them to do something, that they'll begin to say, you know what, I need to listen to the person that's over me. And so I remember I used to obey my mother because I didn't want a spanking. I didn't, want, I didn't want her to give me a spanking. Her spankings didn't hurt. I didn't tell her that. I just didn't want her to tell my dad whose spankings did hurt. You know what I mean? So, so and, that, and that's a motivation as we grow up and we begin to learn. But it's not the only motivation that there is. But when I realized that my mom was doing those things out of a, a love for me. She was doing it for my own good. She was doing it so that I would actually grow up and actually be a, 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 a somewhat acceptable part of society. It changed my perspective on why I did the things that she was asking me to do. She wanted me to clean my face so that I wouldn't have zits. You know, um, she wanted me... So you guys didn't laugh. Um, she, 
She wanted me to clean my room so that I didn't grow science projects in it. You know what I mean? She taught me to have a, a work ethic because someday she wanted me to good, be a good employee. She wanted me to pay my debts because she wanted me to learn the value of work and the value of money. She wanted me to tithe because she knew the blessing that she had experienced herself. So God's desire for obedience in us is not just for his benefit. It's also for your benefit and my benefit. 1 John 4.18 says it this way. There is, look at it, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with, look at it, for fear has to do with what? I don't want to spank him. It hurts. I still want to do what I want to do, though. I still want to light matches, blow them out, light matches, set them on fire. Not people, but stuff. I still want to light matches, light firecrackers. Stick it in frogs' mouths. You know, I, I, I still want to, you know what I'm saying? You know, I'm, I'm just saying. I, I still, you know, fear, not really. I'm just kidding. For, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears, look at this, whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. He, he loves, and so we're, we aren't motivated out of fear. Even though he is fearsome, he could squish you like a bug. He could squish me like a bug. But guess what? God in his grace, mer- great mercy didn't choose to do that. He chose to love you and I anyway. And, and he, he counts us as priceless possessions and he puts value upon us. And the deal is, is that the deal is, is that he has overcome the world. And you and I should be overcomers as well. Amen? There's a third aspect of a true believer's life, and that's an overcomer's delight. And I want to go through these very quickly because John, as he describes the fantastic delights of the overcomer later on in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, there are seven letters to the seven churches. And those those seven churches, uh, we don't know everything about those seven churches, but they kind of represent the church in general. If you look at the church in general across uh, they could have literally been to the churches in in Asia Minor, but we look at the, the seven churches or the seven letters to the seven churches, and the end of each letter is a promise. And it's so interesting because the promises are none other than, you guessed it, the, the subject that we're talking about today, the idea of, of Nike or Nikeo, Nikau, o- overcomer, the idea, these promises are given to true believers. And in these particular churches where God was their source... Uh, they, they, they were applicable then, but they are also applicable now. God's placed them in Scripture for an example to us. And so I want you to see this. Uh, they apply to us. There are seven delights of the overcomer. These are delights. And, and I would encourage you, if you haven't taken notes at all yet, I want you to just write these down because um, it, it's going to be very handy for you. Uh, if you look at them, there are seven delights of an overcomer. There are, there are some things that God has placed in our lives as believers Not just to overcome, but there are things that we get as a result of being an overcomer. And he's the one that helps us to get that. So I want you to see these. Um, The first one is this, the the tree of life. The tree of life, um, Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, you can look at it. But the first delight of of an overcomer is a gift. If you, it, it originates back in the garden and it disappears for a while and then it comes back in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 and then shows back up uh, later on. But Revelation chapter 2 It says this, he who has an ear, and he's talking to the churches. He says, he who has an ear, one particular church, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he says, and to the one who, Nikau, to the one who, Nikau, the one who Nikes, the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, for those of you who are here who don't know, there was a tree in the Garden of of Eden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we we discussed that the last sermon series. And and when Adam and Eve ate of that tree, they became sinners. But there was another tree in the garden called the tree of life. And God took Adam and Eve out of the garden because he didn't want them to eat of the tree of life. He didn't want sinners 
to have eternal life because that would have brought sin into his eternal dwelling place. So he placed an angel with a flaming sword to guard the garden so they couldn't get back in and eat from the tree of life as a result of the curse. So, but did you know that God transplanted that tree out of the garden into a place called heaven? And Revelation 22 verse 2 says this, In the midst of the street of it, listen to this, this is describing it, the tree. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bore twelve kinds of fruit, fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. So it's, it's a big tree, by the way. It's, it's, it's on both sides of one river. Don't know how that's possible, but it is. And it has 12 kinds of fruit. Have you ever seen a tree like that? I've never seen a tree like that. There, there are no trees like that. And so it yields its fruit every month. And its leaves serve as therapy to the nations. And the word healing, I, I want you to see this because sometimes when we see the word healing, we think that somehow this tree has, you know, it's, it's healing. It, it, it's not referring to the healing of a disease. The idea that we're talking about, it, it refers to providing health. It's, it's healing. It's, 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 there's an enjoyment there as you eat. And we won't be hungry or thirsty in heaven. And I could do a whole entire sermon on heaven. And I'm just going to give you the bits and pieces. But we, we will eat and we will drink for pure enjoyment in heaven. So the promises of Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 is heaven. Someday you and I are going to experience God's president, uh, presence in heaven. We are going to experience God's presence in paradise. And I don't know about you. But there is something that's very spectacular. The older I get, the more I realize all the things in this world are fading away. But God, his presence never, never, never fails. Amen. Isn't that exciting? I don't know about you, but don't you look forward to heaven? Don't you look forward to a day when there's no more cancer? When there's no, where where moth and rust don't corrupt? Where there's no sin? Man, there's a second delight of the overcomer, and that's eternal life. Look at it in Revelation 2, verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil, and he's talking to another church here, but the devil is about to show, uh, throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days you'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And then he says, verse 11, he who has an ear, listen to it. He says it again. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, he, he's talking to us too. The one who conquers, the one who Nikau, the one who Nikes will not be hurt by the second death. There are two deaths mentioned in scripture. One of them is the physical death. We see people die. But then there is a second death called the spiritual death. Spiritual death results in eternal death. And and the point is everyone will physically die. But the believer, let me tell you, they will never, ever spiritually die. And the man or woman who is not an over... uh, A man or woman who is not an overcomer dies only to die again. A spiritual death. But let me tell you, not the overcomer in Jesus Christ. That is an exciting fact. The fact is, is that God has made you an overcomer. Because there's going to come a day where he's like, you know what? You don't have to... You can rest in me someday. There's going to be a day when there's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any more work. There's not going to be any more. There's going to, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's, there's going to be things that we're doing in heaven, but one of the main things we're going to be doing in heaven is we're going to be worshiping God and giving God glory, and we're going to get to have a relationship with Jesus Christ forever and ever. That's what an overcomer looks like. The overcomer dies. They die to live forever. There's a third delight of the overcomer, and that's the idea of, of manna. The bread of life. The third delight of an overcomer is the hidden manna of God. And, and then I'm going to talk about just for a second for a white stone from God. Revelation chapter 2. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Is this another church he's referring to? The one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who received it. Listen very carefully to me this morning. The overcomer receives two things. The first one is the idea of, of hidden manna. 
me just tell you, have you ever had, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had someone just kind of like, that's maybe a close family member, and they, they see you going to church, they see you reading your Bible, they don't understand it, they don't understand why you do that, they don't understand why it is that you pray, they don't understand why all the things that you're doing, why are you doing those things, that just seems so crazy, you're just kind of cray-cray in the head, you know what I mean, they kind of look at you that way, and they kind of act that way towards you, and then they finally just say, hey, you know what, I don't really understand why you do that, and let me just tell you, there's some things you will never understand unless you experience them for yourself. There's some things that you will never know. You will never know the redeemable part of the sin that I've been forgiven of, the things that I've done, including the frogs, okay, including things that are worse than that. Let me just tell you, I have been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. I have been forgiven. God has wiped those things clean. I am free in him. And so what happens is, is I can go to bed at night without worrying about what's going to happen to me if I die. If I die before I wake, I pray, Lord, my soul to take. That used to be kind of a scary prayer to me. But the deal is, is when I begin to realize that I have a hope in heaven, that there is some, there's some bread that y'all don't know about. You know what I'm saying? There's some bread that people that don't know Jesus don't know about. He is the bread of life, church. He is the life. He's the way, the truth, the life. There is some th- there's something that happens when we begin to realize that there's this hidden manna. And let me just tell you what hidden manna through Scripture is. It's Jesus. Over and over again, we see it. I've had people ask me before, PT, well, what will heaven be like? And there are some things that, 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 that we know heaven about, uh, uh, that we know will happen in heaven. We, we know that there's going to be streets of gold. We know that there's going to be uh, some really, there's some pearly gates, and a lot of people refer to those. But the biggest thing of all, let me just tell you, heaven is where Jesus is. Heaven is where, some of us aren't excited about that. We were more excited about the gold and the streets of, the, the streets of gold and, you know, we get more excited about that kind of stuff because, like, I've never seen that before. Well, you've never seen Jesus before. That's why you're excited about that and not Jesus. So I'm just saying, what a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, what a glorious day that will be when we get to see Jesus. Jesus is who we are going to see when we get to heaven. And then uh, there's a second thing I want you to see that we're going to receive from the bread of life, Jesus himself, and that's this, a white stone. God will not only give us manna, but a white stone as well. You may say, what's, what's that all about? I'm not quite sure exactly, but I do know this. Here's what I do know. In the Greek text, the white stone refers to a diamond. And there is a debate about what that might mean, and, but this morning I have one thought. In the Old Testament, the priest had a bright stone on his breastplate called the Urim. And when people wanted to know God's will, he, he revealed it in that particular stone. So the white stone may refer to an absolute and ultimate knowledge of God's will. And so what more could we ask than to have all of God's revelation and knowledge given to us in glory? We see scriptures and passages like the, the, the fact that we will be known as we're known. There will be passages where we, we see that, man, uh, you know, right now we look through a glass dimly, but then someday we will see face to face. We will understand and we will know. There will be things that we know that, and, and so I know that sometimes we think, well, I got questions to ask Jesus in heaven. I can guarantee you that that won't even be an issue because you'll see, be so overwhelmed and over overworked up about Jesus and how great he is and how marvelous he is. But this I know, God is going to give each of us a crystal in which a new name will be written. And I don't know, maybe your name was mud down here. I don't know. Maybe your name was was not as great of a name as it could have been. Or maybe sometimes, here's the deal. Sometimes what happens is, is you ever notice how the wicked can prosper? And how, how people that maybe do the wrong things can end up being lifted up? And I'm not saying that every single person that prospers is wicked. Please don't get me wrong. But the deal is, is the wicked prosper, uh, prosper. And, and the people, they do, they, they do uh, uh, Psalm, Psalm 2, they, they do plot an evil thing against the Lord. And the deal is, is that there are people that, that, that do sometimes get advanced because they did the wrong thing. And the deal is, is that maybe you did the right thing. I'm going to tell you right now, there is an honor 
that will happen in heaven, God will give a white stone and it will be known only by the person who receives my stone. It's going to say one thing. Yours is going to say something else. We will be individuals in heaven. And what will be, what will your name, new name be? No one will know but the, the, the one who put it on you. And I don't know about, about you, but maybe I, I know this. It's going to be sentimental. I know that it's going to be fantastic. God's going to put a new name on you. And I don't know if it's just going to be Tony, the saved one. I don't know. But I know it's going to mean something to me because my salvation means a lot to me. The point is, is your relationship with God is going to be personal. It's going to be forever. We are going to be in the presence of the hidden manna, Jesus Christ. We're going to be eating of the tree of life and drinking up the water from the crystal river flowing from his throne above. Let me just tell you, we're never going to be, we're never going to be touched by the second death, a spiritual death. We're going to be alive in Jesus Christ. And if you think about it, those are some amazing promises. There's a fourth delight of the overcomer, and that's the power of life. Jesus gives two more things to overcomers. He gives power over the nations. If you look at it in verse 26, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Then in verse 27, God will give power over the nations to the Messiah. And as Jesus receives that power, he will give it to us as well. And the point of that is that we will rule and we will reign with Jesus in his millennial kingdom. And some of you just might think, well, he might rule harshly since he's going to do it with a rod like we see in Psalm 2. But the Greek word rule, it's the word we get for shepherd. It's the word for pastor, actually. It's the word poimain. It's translated shepherd. It will be a shepherd's rod, not a billy club. Can you imagine ruling with Jesus? I mean, some of you might say, well, I'm not even a boss here on earth. I'm not even, I don't even have leadership capabilities right here. I mean, remember, our ruling in the kingdom has nothing to do with what we got. I mean, I'm telling you, it's by pure grace and grace alone in Jesus Christ. He has bestowed gifts upon his people. And so there is a second thing that Jesus gives that represents life, and that's uh, uh, the morning star. And who is the morning star? We look throughout scripture, it's Jesus himself. You know who's going to be, you know who's going to be yours in heaven? I think it's Sandy. Who's going to be yours in heaven? Jesus is going to be yours in heaven. I think, I think of the Darbros. Who's going to be yours in heaven? Jesus is going to be yours in heaven. I, th- I, think, it's, I think the na- naps. I, I think you guys. You know who's going to be y'all's in heaven? I know you're not supposed to say it that way because you're from New York, y'all. But the deal is, is she's at least from Missouri. So, so you can say that a little more. But you know who's going to be yours in heaven? Jesus. Think about it. He's going to be yours. He's going to be mine. Jesus Christ, the one who died for us, who took our place, is going to be ours. And he is the morning star. Jesus is given to people who overcome. There's a fifth delight, and that's the book of life. Revelation 3, 5 gives us the fifth delight. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. In John's day, what happened was is kings had a registry, and all the people's names would be put into the registry. And when anyone committed a criminal act, his name would be removed from that registry. And so our Lord here is saying the idea is that the world may uh, cross some of y'all off the list. The world may not pick you first. The world may not do things that put you up here in the top of the list. Kings may remove your name for the crime of being a Christian, but I will never blot your name out of my book. So when you and I get to heaven, something's going to happen. Jesus is going to say, I don't know, Father, angels, here is Derek Hawes. Father, angels, here is Amy Hawes. Isn't that exciting? Father, angels, here's Jamie Gillen. Woohoo! How many of you are like, what is he talking about? Anybody? Okay, good. I hope not. But I don't know about you, but there's going to happen. That something's going to happen, and, and he is going to introduce us. We are going to be like, hey, here he is, and Jesus Christ, because we're known as we're known up there. There's going to be some people that the Father says, I never knew you. Depart from me. But man, the ones who knew Jesus... That's a different animal. There's a sixth delight of the overcomer. That's the name of life. Revelation 3.12 then says, The one who conquers, I will give him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven. And my own new name 
In John's day, an important person was honored by placing a pillar inscribed with his name in the local temple. And so great temples to certain gods became monuments of honor to finance uh, uh, famous, they would, they would help finance the temple. And so famous citizens, because uh, famous citizens would have their marks on these pillars. And so, um, and so as overcomers, you and I have pillars in the celestial hall of heaven. I mean, you think about it as overcomers. You and I have pillars in the celestial hall of heaven. In fact, we are pillars. Historically, I mean, this letter is written to the church of Philadelphia. It's interesting because which, it, it was located near a volcano field. And, and they were constantly being subjected to earthquakes. And, and whenever an earthquake would occur, the people would flee from the city and, because it was often destroyed. And the Lord was saying to this group of believers, he was saying this. He was saying, you know what, I'm going to make you pillars. And what's going to happen is, is you're never going to, you're never going to have to flee. And the reason you're never going to have to flee is because you're never going to have to fear. You're not going to have to worry about it. In heaven, there is no fear. No pillar has ever collapsed in heaven. And so don't be worried about it. You're secure in Jesus Christ. How many of you are thankful for a God who saves us and there is a certainty that we have in him? Amen? I mean, come on, church. I mean, I'm telling you, we have something in Jesus Christ. There is a seventh day delight of the overcomer as the worship team begins to make their way back. The seventh delight of the overcomer is written in Revelation 3.21, and it says this, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. In other words, the idea is here that we are going to be co-reigning with Jesus Christ. Folks, this is what it means to be an overcomer. I ask you this question this morning as no one, as you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Are you an overcomer? Are you an overcomer? The only way to be an overcomer is to, to be able to say, you know what, I have Jesus Christ on the throne of my heart. Jesus Christ is the way, truth, and the life. He's not just a way, a truth, and a life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he's my way, my truth, and my life. Jesus Christ is everything to me. Maybe you're here this morning and that's not the case. Maybe you're here today and, you know, you look at these, you hear these these promises that God has given to believers who have been born of God. Or maybe you're here today and maybe the life that you bear is born out of fear. Maybe the life you have is maybe born out of selfish desire. Maybe the life you have is born out of, you're, you're just trying to figure out what to do. You keep jumping and running from one thing to the next instead of being born into God's kingdom. Sometimes people are born into religion. They, were, they are born into a religious system and it's not necessarily biblical. But God is wanting a relationship. He's wanting a relationship with you. He's wanting to be your source. He's wanting to be your source of life, of hope, of strength. He's wanting you to make him Lord. In other words, he's wanting to make you, he's wanting, he, he, you, he's wanting you to make him the king of your heart. The one who helps you see the decisions you should make. Maybe you've been Christian in name only. Or maybe you've never really had anything to do with God. And today you're sensing that maybe God is talking to you today. He's drawing you to himself today. He does that. He draws people to himself. That's the Holy Spirit working in your heart today. And he convicts us of sin and he draws us toward God. And today it's, it really is your sin that separates you from God. God says in the Bible that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short. We've missed the mark. We've not been conquerors. We've not overcome, but with Jesus Christ, we can overcome the world. That's why Jesus sent his son to earth. That's why God sent his son Jesus to earth, to save us from sin. And and there really is life more abundantly. A thief, he comes to steal, he comes to steal, he he comes to kill, he comes to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life, and I've come to give it to you more abundantly. So he's calling you today. He's knocking on the door of your heart this morning. And you want to only not 
for God to save you from your sin, but you want him to be your master, your Lord, for him to be in control. He wants to be, but, but won't force you to, to make him Lord. You have to submit yourself to God this morning. Right now, within the sound of my voice, you know Jesus is calling your name and you need to make him the Lord of your life because he's not the Lord of your life today. Right now, without anybody looking around, this is not meant to embarrass a bunch of people. It's not meant for that. This is a decision between you and God. Right now, you're saying, Jesus Christ needs to be the Lord of my life, and I know it, and I want to make that decision today. That's, that's me today. Right now, right where you're at, right where you're sitting, you would just, with head still bowed and eyes still closed, you would just slip your hand up right now before God. That's you today. Yes. God sees your hand. God sees your hand. Thank you to my left. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You can put your hand back down. Anyone else? Right here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for lifting your hand to my right. Thank you. That's two people. Anyone else today? There's two so far. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else here today? You need to make a decision to commit your life to the, to the Lord. You want to be an overcomer. You want to be a, a Nikau. You want to you be Nike. That's you today. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. I see your hand again. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want us to just stand if we could today. I want us to stand. some exciting news I got I got some exciting news to a bunch of overcomers in a room today think about it we're adding people that are going to get to partake from the tree of life with us because two people are asking God to be their Lord and Savior today I don't know if that I don't know if that was worth the wait because it's 1235 I don't know if that was worth the wait but to me, it was worth the wait. Because Jesus Christ, he's the king, amen? He's Lord of lords. He's Lord of all. And so this morning, we're going to pray a prayer. We're going to lead these two people in a prayer. But we're not going to leave them hanging out there by themselves, amen? We're going to pray with them. And so right now, we're just going to pray a prayer. We're going to ask Jesus to come and be the source, the strength, the life in our life. And then what I'm going to do is we're going to... We're going to give you a Bible. We're going to give you a box. Have some information in it. And Tony, Leanne, could you wave back there? It's just, if you turn around and you look all the way to the back in the corner, we're just going to connect with you real quick after church. But I'm telling you right now, today, Jesus Christ is bringing two more into the fold, and I'm excited about that. So Let's pray together. Can we do that right now? These two that are, that, are, that are asking Jesus in your heart right now, just mean it with all of your heart today. You repeat after me. Heavenly Father, let's say it again. Heavenly Father, today I surrender my whole life to you. I repent. I turn from my sin. Jesus, come and save me and be my Lord today. I want to do what your will is. Cleanse me from all my sin. Fill me with your spirit right now. I want to serve you. I want you to help me to follow you. And live for you. Take my life. I recognize it's not my own. I've been bought with a price. Through Jesus Christ. I give my life back to you thank you for new life in Jesus Christ in Jesus name I pray and everybody in the house said amen let's give God glory can we do that